One of the highlights of the Seder is the singing of Dayenu, a universal song that I've heard from people from all different countries, all different backgrounds, Svardim, Ashkenazim, Chabadniks, all different types of Jews. And yet they all know the song of Dayenu. And so let's discuss the Dayenu on five levels of Pshat and Aremiz and Drush and Soyid and Chsidis and to understand it a bit deeper. First and foremost, who wrote the Dayenu song? From the Abarbanel, it seems that this is a continuation of the previous paragraph in the Haggadah, which is stated by Rabbi Akiva. And therefore, it would seem that Rabbi Akiva is the author of these words of the Dayenu. And we go on to say, How many good favors has the omnipresent done for us? And there are 15 different things that are mentioned here in the Dayenu. Now the word malos, what does malos mean? The Barbanel says malos means favors. The Maral says malos means levels, 15 levels God has done for us. And according to the Chida, the word malos actually has the same letters as alamos, which means hidden. That even though we are speaking about 15 favors that God has performed for us, in essence there are many hidden things that we don't even explain or talk about, but that God performed for us in Egypt and also every day of our lives. There are the revealed miracles that we see that God performs for us, and then there are those that are concealed. What are the Dayenus? One of the Dayenus is Ilu Asa Belihehe. The Leharag is Bechereyem Dayenu. Which means if God would have simply destroyed the idols and the gods of the Egyptians, but he would have not killed the firstborns, Dayenu, it would have sufficed us, it would have been sufficient. Now, the Rebbe asks a question in his Haggadah, and he says, if you look into the actual Chumash, into the Torah, in the book of Exodus, it seems that the order is the opposite. Because in Exodus 12, 12, it says first, God said, I will go and smite all the firstborn of the Egyptians, and then I will smite their gods. As Rashi explains over there, that the wooden gods became defaced and deformed and the metal gar gods of gold and silver and metal and iron they melted to the ground so from the verse in the Torah it seems first God said I will kill the firstborn then I will smite the gods of the Egyptians and similarly we find in verse 29 in chapter 12 it says that God smote the firstborns of Egypt from man and the firstborns of the animals. So the Mechilta says that the animals were actually the gods of the Egyptians. And this is a famous question that people ask me, why did God smite the firstborn of the animals? What did they do? But the answer is that the Egyptians served the animals as their gods. So therefore God also smit the animals of the Egyptians. But from the Pasuk in number 12 and Pasuk in 29, it seems that first God smit the firstborn of the Egyptians and then only after that did he smite their gods. 
And yet, in the Haggadah here, it seems to follow the verses in the Torah, the chronological order, it says the opposite. That if God would have simply destroyed their gods, their deities, but he would not have killed the firstborns, Dayenu would have been enough. So the Rebbe says that based on the Mechilta we can understand this. Because the Mechilta goes on to say what is the reason that God smit the, the firstborn of the animals. The Mechilta goes on to say so that the Egyptians should not say that it was our gods that brought the death on the firstborns. In other words, perhaps we were too nice to the Jews. If we would have been worse to the Jews and more evil and cruel and inflict more pain upon them, then our gods would not have punished us. But because we were too nice to the enemy, to the infidel, therefore we have all this bad luck. So therefore, what does God do? He goes and he kills the firstborn of the animals, which are the deities of the Egyptians. And he deforms and defames and defaces all their, their idols and they melt to the ground. Now there are no more gods left. Only one God, the God of the Jewish people. Then he goes and he smites the firstborn of the Egyptians. Says the Rebbe, that's why the Haggadah says, if God would have destroyed their gods, but not killed their firstborn, Dayenu, it would have been enough. And therefore, the way we read the passage in the Torah, that it says, Vikesi kol Bukhar, that I will kill the firstborn of the Egyptians and I will destroy the gods of the Egyptians, says the Rebbe, we read that because I am going to kill the firstborn of the Egyptians, therefore I will first kill the gods of the Egyptians. And now we understand why the Agada writes it in this way. So that is the Pshat. That is a simple interpretation of the verse in the Dayenu. What is the remez? What is the hint? At the end of the Dayenu we say, Ilu hechnisanu li eretz Yisrael, if God would have brought us into the land of Israel. But he would not have built for us the house of Bechira, which means the holy temple. But literally, Beis HaBechira means the chosen house. The house that God chose. Dayenu would have been enough. And in many Agodis, or in Sama Goddess, rather, it does not say the word Beis HaBechira, it actually says Beis HaMikdash. If God would have taken us into the land of Israel, but He would not have built for us the Beis HaMikdash, Dayenu, it would have been enough. There are even Sama Goddess that have both, the Beis HaMikdash and the Beis HaBechira. In the paragraph after that, it says, Al-Achas Kam Vakamma, we say God did all of these things for us and he built for us the Beis HaBechira, the chosen house, and then it adds L'chaper al kol to forgive us from our sins. So the question is, what is the difference between Beis HaMikdash and the Beis HaBechira? The holy temple or the chosen temple? And how is this remez? Remez means a hint to the future, to the coming of Mashiach. And perhaps we can say this is based on the, the words of the Ben Ishchai. The Ben Ishchai says that there's a difference between the terminology Beis HaMikdash and Beis HaBechira. 
The holy temple implies a temple created by man. Beis Abichira implies a temple created by God. So man made it holy. We created the temple. But then there's also the temple that God has chosen. And that is the temple that he created already in heaven, the third holy temple, that will descend from heaven. And that is hinted, says the uh, Ben Ishchai in the word Bechira, Bochar Yudke, God chose. That God chose this temple. In other words, he created this temple. This is the third holy temple that will come down from heaven and will never ever be destroyed. And therefore in the Dayenu, we are not only thanking God for the past, but also we are hinting to the future. We are praying to God and beseeching God to bring down the Beis HaBechira, to bring down this house of choice. That is the Rem, is the hint. What is the Drush, the homiletics? So it says in the Dayenu, one of the verses state that Ilu Kervanu Lefnei Har Sinai V'loi Nasan Lo Nuesa Toyla Dayenu if God would have brought us close to Sinai, up to Sinai, but he would not have given us the Torah, Dayenu, it would have been enough. Now this seems to be very difficult to comprehend. All the other things make sense. Okay, we understand that he wouldn't have killed their gods. Okay, but he would, would have taken us out of Egypt. That would have been enough. It could have been that he killed their gods, but he didn't kill their firstborn. It would have been enough. But what does it mean? He would have taken us to Sinai, but not given us the Torah. Isn't the entire purpose of bringing us to Sinai to give us the Torah? So here the Rebbe and God that gives two answers. And he says, what was the greatness of Sinai? The greatness of Sinai was that it states in Deuteronomy 5.21, chapter 5, verse 21, Behold, God, our God, has shown us his glory and his greatness. We saw kvoidoi ves godloi. We saw God's glory and God's greatness. In other words, Sinai itself represents the revelation. Even without giving us the Torah, by going to Sinai and seeing God, by seeing God, you see truth, you change. Rabbi Emanuel Shachat of, uh, of blessed memory would say that the Jews at Sinai did not believe in God. They saw God. They didn't have to believe in God. So the manifestation of God on Sinai that alone is the greatest accomplishment, the revelation of God, even without giving us the Torah. That's one approach the Rebbe takes. Then he says another thing, that Sinai means, if we would have gone to Sinai and not received the Torah, means that at Sinai we heard the Ten Commandments. God spoke to us. He gave us Ten Commandments. Till now we had basically one or two or three commandments. There were seven laws, the seven Noachide laws. We also had Shabbos, etc., etc. But now God spoke to us and He told us these Ten Commandments. That would have been Dayenu. It would have been enough. But you know what? God was so kind. He gave us the Luchos, He gave us the tablets. And God was so kind to us, and He gave us the Torah, the 613 commandments. God was so kind to us, he gave us also the Mishnah and the Gemara and the Zoyar and the Kabbalah and Chassidus. He was so kind to us. But Dayenu, it would have been enough if he even gave us the Ten Commandments. That is the Drush, the homiletics of the Dayenu. What is the Soid? What is the esoteric level of Dayenu? We stated earlier that there are 15 favors that God performed for us in the Dayenu. Starting from the first one, taking us out of Egypt, 
and the number 15 building for us the holy temple says the Maral of Prague what is the concept of 15 the number 15 it says first of all each one of these 15 are not simply 15 independent concepts but each one goes higher and higher we start with the lowest and we end with the highest and he says this is like 15 steps between the Ezra's Nashim and the Ezra's Yisrael the place for the women and the place for the men in the holy temple there were 15 steps and these 15 steps are based on the 15 Psalms of ascent that King David has in the book of Tehillim, the Shir Hamalois, the songs of the ascent, the songs of the steps going higher and higher, which allude to the 15th day of the month when the moon has waxed to its complete glory and the Jewish people are compared to the moon, which alludes to the 15 generations from Avraham to King Solomon who built the Holy Temple. Why 15? Because 15 is the name of God. Yud and He are the first two letters of God's name, but also Yud and He are the name of God alone. As the Torah says, Ki bi Yud Ke Tzure Lomim. God said, I fashion the worlds with the Yud and the He. As the Gemara explains, with the letter Yud, God created all of the heavens, paradise. The Yud represents a flame, it's very spiritual. And the letter He is the letter God used to fashion the physical world down here. The He has three lines representing three dimensions, the physical world. Also the world of thought, speech, and action. And that is why the Zohar says God created the world with the letter He. He went and from the ha of the letter he, all of the ten utterances of speech came out and God created every single physical living or stationary inanimate object in the world. All from this letter he. So the yud and the he, the yud is ten, the he is five, this is the name of God, this alludes to all of the worlds and therefore these 15 malot, these 15 steps represent and encompass God's greatness and God's kindness from the lowest of this world until the highest of the highest world and that is the the approach according to Kabbalah why there are 15 and not 16 praises and thanks and favors in this song. What does Hasidus say? The last of the 15 was that God built for us the Beis HaBechira, the house that he chose. And therefore we have a few questions over here. The Rebbe asks, why does it say God built for us the Beis HaBechira, the house that he chose, and not simply use the term that the Torah says, which is called the Beis HaMikdash, the Holy Temple. As we know, the Torah says, V'osuli Mikdash v'shachanti b'soycho, make for me a dwelling place and I will dwell in them. But Mikdash is a holy temple. Make for me, says God, a holy temple, a holy house. So the word in the Torah to describe the building of the temple is Mikdash, holy. Yet the Bala Goda, the one who wrote this song, uses the words Beis Habechira, the house of choice, the house that God has chosen. Now, even though there is a hint to that in the Torah, it says God will dwell in the place Hashem, that He will choose. But yet the, the commandment is specifically Mikdash, the Holy Temple. Furthermore, as we stated earlier, at the end of the next paragraph, 
It says that God gave us all of these favors and he gave us the Beis HaBechira, the house that he chose, and then it adds Lechaper, Akol Avinu to forgive for all of our sins. Why is it from all of the 15 favors that God has performed for us, do we give only when it came to the 15th a reason? Because he wanted to forgive us for our sins. Furthermore, if you think about the holiness of the Holy Temple, what makes it so special? As we said in the verse earlier, Make for me a dwelling place and I will dwell in that building. I will dwell in that home. In other words, the Shekhinah, God's presence is there. Isn't that the reason why God made a base Abechira? Yet here in the Haggadah we say, why did God make this home to forgive us for our sins? Why the negative? Why focus on the negative? Why not the positive? So the Rebbe goes on to explain that the God is telling us here, Kama Mailis Toivus. How many favors Lamokoim did the omnipresent perform Aleinu for us? Not what we did for God, but what God did for us. To make the place a holy temple that is us creating God's temple. To choose that is God choosing us. What does that mean? What is the definition of choice? How do you choose? If you have an apple and an orange on the table. And I like, let's say, the apple. So I choose the apple over the orange. That's not called choice. It's the obvious choice. That's not called free choice. Real choice, free choice means that two things are exactly alike and I choose one over the other. In other words, if there's a soul and a body and God chooses the soul over the body, that's an obvious choice. The soul is holy. So God chooses the soul over the body. What is the definition that God chose the Jewish people? That even though they have a body, and even though in the body they can sin, and they're earthly, still in all, God not only chose their soul, He also chose their body. That's the choice. The body is like all the nations of the world. And yet He chose the body of the Jewish people. That is the meaning to choose. And therefore, what do we say? That God chose the Holy Temple to show and prove the world that He chose the Jewish people. What is the Beis HaBechira? What is this house of choice? Two things. Number one, it was made out of stone. And in the world there is stone, which is inanimate, there is vegetation, there is animal, there is man. So the lowest of all of the creation is stone. And yet, where does he choose to dwell? Not in a place of vegetation, not in a place of animal, not in a place of man, but specifically in a house of stone. Number two, who built this house of stone? Hiram, who was the king of Tzor. He was not Jewish. And he could have taken this stone and built his own palace with the stone. Yet God said, I want that stone. And I will dwell in that stone that Hiram built. By doing this, God proves to the entire world that Atta b'chartanu mikola amim. The favor that God is doing to us is that I am choosing you from all the nations of the world. Even the body. Even if you sin. Even if you violate all 613 commandments. Why? Because I want to. I choose to. Because I love you. 
as it says in the Talmud, this way or that way, if you follow the Torah, if you don't follow the Torah, it's impossible for me to exchange you for another nation. And even though Esau and Yaakov are brothers, still in all I choose Jacob over Esau. That is why in the Haggadah we say, Beis <coughs> HaBechira, the house of choice, not the holy temple, implying what God has favored and done for us. Therefore, comes along the author of the Haggadah and says, you should know, it's in order to forgive you for your sins. Why? Because one might mistakenly think, being that God loves us anyway, who cares about doing a mitzvah? Why should I be good? Why should I do a mitzvah? Why should I do the right thing? Why should I study the Torah? Why should I dive and why should I give charity? God loves me anyway. Comes along that God and says, no. It's to forgive you for all of your sins. On the contrary, when a child sins, because the father loves the child so much, it hurts the father even more. He loves you. You're his child. He loves you unconditionally. At the same time, when the child misbehaves, it hurts the father even more that it's my child who's misbehaving. And therefore, even though God chooses you at the same time, we have to remember, it's we have to work hard to be worthy of this title. We have to work hard to be worthy of being God's chosen people. These uh, 15 Dayenus are read together, they're sung together. And uh, as the Rebbe says that his father-in-law, the previous Rebbe, would not stop in between to give commentary. He would wait till you finish all 15. And one of the uh, implications that is derived from this is that we in our daily life, sometimes we find ourselves in Egypt. We find ourselves in the abyss. We find ourselves in the slums. And we try to schlep ourselves out of this Egypt. We try to schlep ourselves out of this border and constraint, this limitation. This land of Egypt, which is known to be the most promiscuous of all the lands of the world. So, we, we schlep ourselves out of Egypt. We say, oh, Dayenu, thank God I'm not so bad. I could be a lot worse. I'm not as bad as that guy is. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Dayenu. It's enough. Who says I have to strive to be more spiritual? Who said I have to strive to become more holy? Who said I have to strive to be the best? As long as I'm not the worst, I'm already good. Dayenu. Says the Rebbe, therefore my father-in-law did not stop after the first Dayenu. But he continued to sing and to read the entire 15 favors that God did. All the Dayenus. Because even on the lowest level, a person should never suffice with pulling himself out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt. But you always have to strive to go higher and higher until you get to the base Abichira, until you get to the home that God chooses. And perhaps we can say that Dayenu is also a message for all of us. Being in exile for so many years, and knowing that, that the Pesach Seder is not only a Seder of the past, but also Lahavi Limoisa Mashiach, as we say in the Haggadah, that even after Mashiach comes, we are going to have a Pesach Seder. And furthermore, Lahavi Limoisa Mashiach, to bring us to the coming of Mashiach. When we say Dayenu Ayid, a person has to think in his mind, Dayenu is enough. 
It's enough pain, enough suffering, human suffering, strife, poverty, war, death. Just look around the world, look into the media, look into the newspapers, look what's happening. The world is out of control. People are doing crazy things. And it's not getting better. Dayenu, it's enough already. We have to ask God that He Himself should come down. We don't need any emissary, we don't need any angel, we don't need any uh, saraf. But just like He Himself came down and took us out of Egypt, so too we ask God, Dayenu, it's enough. Come down and take us out of this goals. And so we hope and pray, Lishana Babi Rishalayim. The next year in Jerusalem, with the building of the base Abakira, that God Himself will choose and God Himself will build. And therefore, as it says, all the nations of the world will stream and flow towards this holy temple, for they will see the one God, the one God of all the nations of the world, the God of peace, the God of truth, with the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days.